I lied to you. I made this video saying it could help protect you from $50 million, but it should have said $1.4 billion. The Bybit exchange was hacked for $1.4 billion. And here's the CEO talking about what happened. We were doing a, a regular cold wallet transfer. Bybit uses SAFE, which means we use the, the SAFE product. It's the SAFE.global. I was the last signer of this transaction. When this transaction came, it was a normal URL. I double checked and then I checked on the UI the destination address all of that checked out so i clicked on sign so after i signed and i also checked the ledger screen so i checked the code but i didn't check fully after I signing 30 minutes later then we got the emergency call so we're going to be showing you exactly what the transaction was and how the hacker put together the transaction to do this hack and then we're going to speculate on how this hack actually happened so if we go directly to the transaction that the ceo or co-founder linked we can see this is just one of the malicious transactions that was called. This is a sweep ETH transaction. And we can see that around 400,000 ETH was transferred from their cold wallet to the Bybit exploiter. Yikes. But it gets worse. If we go to the actual cold wallet and we scroll down to the list of transactions in here, we see 13 hours ago this exec transaction. And being familiar with the safe UI, I know that this exec transaction is how you initiate any transaction on your multi-sig wallet. But above these, we see sweep ERC-20, sweep ETH, sweep ERC-20, sweep ERC-20, sweep ERC-20. So it's these collection of five transactions that were the ones to actually steal the money out of the multisig. And it was this one that was most likely to have given the hacker access to actually steal all the funds out. Right. And if we look at some of these transactions, we can very quickly see how much each one of these stole. We can see this one stole $90, so probably a test transaction. The next one was the 400,000 ETH that was stolen. The next one for 8,000 M ETH, around $22 million. The next one for around 250 million ST ETH. And then a final one for around 52 million CM ETH. So in total, around $1.4 billion. Now to see exactly how this hack happened, we can go directly to this transaction here and see what the hacker actually sent. So if we scroll down in here, we can go to more details. We can see the actual input data of this. And if I decode the input data, we can see all this information here. And this is the input data to the multi-sig contract itself. So whenever you wanna call a transaction on your multi-sig, you're really calling this exec transaction, which has all the data that you want to send a transaction. So for example, if you wanted to send some money from an ERC-20 token, you would say, okay, I'm gonna have my two address be the ERC-20 address, I'm gonna have value be zero, and I'm gonna have the bytes called data to be the call data for a transfer function. Going back over here, we, can get tipped off to some of the issues that this transaction has that the signers didn't catch. And we'll talk about why they didn't catch it in just a second as well. We can see first off the two address is this address here. And this is kind of one of the first kind of confusing things that can make it a little bit tricky for users to get slipped up here. Now the, the two address is this address in the input data. However, the actual two is to the multi-sig. Now, even here is where it can get kind of tricky because on your wallet, the wallet's gonna say, hey, the two address is the multi-sig address. And that is correct. You are sending a transaction to the multi-sig address, but that multi-sig is then gonna call some other malicious address. And that's actually gonna be hidden in the data over here. So if all you did was spot check the two address, you would see the two address being the multi-sig and you go, oh, okay, cool. Like that looks good to me, but that's not enough. So hidden in the data, we have to be this other address here. And if we click on this address and we go to this address here, we scroll down in here, we can see this was created three days ago. So this person was prepping this for three days. We can see in the contract, this obviously isn't verified, but it's this incredibly minimal contract. This code is actually small enough. There's like barely any bytecode in this that I could literally take a day and I could read every single one of these. Like this isn't that hard to decode. So we're sending to this transaction and we're sending this data here, which I'll get to why this is actually kind of clever. This operation being one is the next thing that should absolutely been like, holy shit, we cannot do this. So in the multi-sig contract, if operation is zero, then it's just going to be a regular call, right? These are a little bit safer. But if operation is one, it's going to be a delegate call. And so if we go back to the actual transaction here, we can see the operation is a one, which means that we're gonna be delegate calling whatever function this random contract is doing. So basically we're trusting this random contract to do whatever the hell they want, which is obviously bad. And then the rest of the parameters are pretty harmless. And then we can see the actual signatures here. 
Now we can see a couple more interesting things here. On this exec transaction on Etherscan, we can go up to state and we can actually see the differences in the contract's state that were changed. Obviously in a proxy contract, all of the state is stored in the proxy contract. And we can see that a couple of storage slots actually did change. So we can see storage slot zero changed and storage slot five changed. And we can actually view this even easier outside of Etherscan. Using cast, I can actually call cast storage on this contract address and pass in the block right before this was executed. And cast will attempt to get the correct storage layout based on the verified contracts. So if I hit enter here, this is gonna give me a horrible formatting. I know this is super tiny, but essentially you can see that at storage slot zero, we see this master copy variable set to this value here. And if we grab this, we pop this into Etherscan. First off, we can see that matches what we see here. And if we paste it in here, we can see this is like a regular safe master copy, basically a safe implementation. This is like a good, solid piece of code. However, after this transaction is executed, we see this implementation changes from this to this. And this is actually where Etherscan I don't love because if we go back to the actual contract address, if we go to contract, it says read as proxy, it still shows the old implementation here. However, that was actually changed, that was updated to this address, which if we paste this in Etherscan, we can see that this is indeed a new malicious contract. But essentially we had this setup where the proxy calls the safe, which called malicious one. This had a delegate call, which basically told our proxy, uh, hey, the new contract, the new safe contract is this one over here. And this is gonna be, so now you should instead point over here to malicious two, which had all this malicious functionality. So that's essentially what happened. And the transaction itself is not that sophisticated, right? It's pretty basic. And this is also, like I said, where I don't love Etherscan because Etherscan says, hey, ABI for the implementation contract at this address. However, we can see from here, the state was changed. The implementation was changed. And if we pull back up our cast here, we can now do a little clear, run that same cast storage call, but update the block to the block right after the hack happened. And we can see even the cast tool tries to fetch the source code from the wrong contract. But in any case, we can see that the master copy at slot zero has now been changed to this different value. And if we pull this over, it's been changed to this new address. This is also why we should maybe get in the habit of using Block Scout. Block Scout actually correctly knows that this is a proxy contract and actually uses the implementation of the contract itself and knows that the implementation has changed. Also, Block Scout is open source, so maybe an additional reason to use Block Scout here. And then additionally, what was kind of cool about this is if you decode the input data, this right here, this piece of data, is the function selector for the transfer function. So it looks like this is going to call transfer on some contract address. However, this is obviously a malicious transaction that's not actually doing a transfer. And if you go view this in the decoder, you scroll down, you see the go to the byte section, it says decoded, it just looks like it's oh, function transfer, address two and amount zero. So it looks kind of harmless right? Except for it's not kind of harmless because it's not actually doing a transfer function here. There is this little uh, little bit here saying, hey, this might not actually be what it does. Haha. <laughs> and like, yeah, that wasn't what it did at all. So the transaction itself, pretty basic, a delegate call to a malicious transaction saying to upgrade the implementation of the proxy to a new one, which they have access to where they can steal all the funds and do whatever they want. So before we look at how this probably happened and how this could have been prevented, we can actually look at some of the keys here that should have tipped these signers off. Number one, we see the address here is clearly wrong, right? The way to have seen this was you read the data from the exec transaction. You see that it's you're sending a transaction to this weird address. Okay, that's super weird. Uh, we shouldn't do that. Then the data itself almost doesn't matter because this should have already tipped you off. But obviously like decoding the data here was just like an extra step these hackers used to possibly trick people. Like, oh, it's just a transfer, ha ha, it's all good. It wasn't a transfer at all. But then the other thing that absolutely should have set off alarm bells was the fact that this was a delegate call. Literally means the users can have your proxy do whatever you want. So this operation should have been a zero and that would have tipped users off as well. And the rest of these are whatever. 
And in that video that I referred to at the beginning of the video, you can and should absolutely verify all these in your hardware wallet and not on your computer screen. And that was the step that they skipped. So the question is, how did this happen? How did they get access to being able to do this? Well, if we go back to our cast, we can look at how the multi-sig was set up right before the hack actually happened. Uh, excuse me, we can see the owner count had a value of six. So there were six owners and the threshold was three. So it was a three of six multi-sig. So the hacker needed to hack three different users in order to send this transaction. Looking at these signatures section, we know that the signatures are actually just concatenated strings, concatenated signatures. We could count the number in here, and we know that a signature is going to be around 65 bytes or 130 hex characters. We know that this is basically three signatures. So what this tells us then is at least three wallets signed this malicious data, and at least three wallets caused this to happen. And that's where we have to start the speculation because we're probably never going to get like a true postmortem. So basically, the co-founder says it appears that this specific transaction was musked. All the signers saw the musk UI, which showed the correct address and the URL was from safe. But basically, they're saying, hey, on the UI, we saw all the correct stuff. Like it didn't say we were sending to this random wallet address. It, it had all the correct stuff. This looks like nearly the exact same attack that happened for the war z x exchange or the radiant capital hack and now the bybit exchange where they said hey the, the the website showed me the correct information but when i went to my wallet i signed the wrong thing so it looks like it's almost exactly the same type of hack big shout out to zach xbt who basically traced this theft back to north korean state sponsored threat actors so it basically looks like they're running the exact same playbook north korea said you know what hacking smart contracts is getting too hard let's just hack the humans humans are way dumber and that seems to be working. Now, the thing that makes this kind of frustrating for me is that literally a few weeks ago, I made a video on how you can actually prevent this type of hack with some caveats, of course. The safe team actually sprung into action here to help figure out what went wrong. If it was an issue on their end, they found no malicious dependencies or no malicious issues on their side. So it was probably the users of the Bybit exchange that were hacked instead. And most likely this was the setup. Their computers were hacked. So on the computer screens, when they went to the safe website, it showed them, hey, this transaction's actually good. And when they said, okay, hit send, the data that was actually sent to their wallets because their computers were hacked was the bad transaction. And there's a good chance that whatever wallet they were using just showed the raw data or blind signing, if you will, instead of the decoded data or the clear signing. And so the users just said, well, I don't know how to decode this. Sure, looks good and sent it. And this is where the hack actually is sophisticated. How were they able to hack three different users' computers and know all three of them weren't going to check the signatures and weren't going to check the transactions? And this is where we can speculate more. Maybe all three devices were the same device. Maybe they were all in the same room. Maybe it was an inside job or somebody on the inside sent them lots of transactions. There's lots of different ways we could speculate here, but this is where, in my opinion, it is more sophisticated if they actually hacked the computer and did something really clever there. So based off of that being the issue, there's a number of ways we can solve this. Number one, you can kind of do this the raw and badass way. And if you're a technical person, if you're on a security council, if you're on an incident response team, you absolutely must know this because, well, it's not acceptable for you to be caught slipping, right? And understanding how to decode call data is really important anyways for you very technical people. So watch that video, learn that video, and don't sign transactions on your multi-sig unless you follow this up. Now, some other people in protocols have been talking about just making sure your wallets must absolutely be able to clear sign and not blind side. And I agree, all wallets should absolutely have this anyways, because it's kind of crazy to have to decode every single piece of data on your hardware wallets, but it must be in the hardware wallet itself. Props to Keystone actually for adding this. And some people want to go even further saying, hey, we need human readable transactions, which I actually think there are a lot of issues with. Human readable transactions are susceptible to front running attacks. So the human readable thing says, hey, you're going to get 10 ETH back and you only get five because you get front run. Additionally, we saw in here, for example, the decoded transaction said, oh, this is safe. It's just calling a transfer function. No problem. Now, obviously, the fact that the two here was wrong, that should have tipped people off. But I digress. There are still risks associated with just purely being like, hey, we need to make these more human readable. But yes, I do agree that wallets should not have blind signing. That is a huge issue. And you should not be blind signing at all. And as always, though, there is no foolproof solution, as Tevano so gracefully puts it. To some extent, if a hacker is sophisticated enough and they get access to your devices, you are f***ing.
If your wallets do not have clear signing capabilities, you must know how to decode the call data yourself. And if you do not know how to decode the call data yourself, you should not be signing transactions on a wallet that handles $1.4 billion dollars. Yes, the Web3 community needs a lot of improvements in this area because we keep seeing this type of attack. But until we have those fixes in, you should not be signing anything on your wallet unless you actually know what the transactions are doing. That's it. Hope you learned something.